Hello, and welcome to the Shortline Safety Institute's webinar for today. Today, we're going to be discussing hazardous materials training program and our overview for that program and a question and answer session with our experts. For our presentation today, I will be your host and from all of us here at the Shortline Safety Institute, we certainly do appreciate your time that you are taking out of your day to continue your quest for knowledge with us. Our webinar platform is brought to you by GoToWebinar, and when you dialed in, you saw that a screen launched, and to your right, you should have a toolbar. And very quickly, I just want to go over some of the features that we will be using throughout today's webinar. You have the screen which launched, launched once you came on, so that should be displayed. But at the end, when we do our question and answer portion, there is a questions box down on the lower right hand side. If you locate that now, there's a little white arrow pointing to the right. And if you click on that white arrow, it'll allow you to type in questions for our question and answer session. Now, with any further ado, I'm going to jump right into our webinar for today. I'm Michelle Malski, I'm the Manager of Safety Programs, and I'll be your narrator, guide, and host through today's journey. If you have any questions, I will leave my contact information at the end, and we can surely continue this conversation after our webinar. So a little bit about our program. We have a grant from the Pipeline Hazardous Materials and Safety Administration, of PHMSA. This grant has allowed us to have a hazardous materials instructor training. And so the purpose of this is to really enhance your railroad's existing awareness about the hazardous materials regulation or the HMR. The program that we built went through a very rigorous process. We had three development courses in which a team of our experts and industry leaders came together and built a very robust program. All of our experts, when you put all their heads together and the years of experience, it's over 500 years. So these guys really know what they're talking about. Our program options are three. We have a direct employee option. We have a train the trainer option. And more recently, we're getting into drills and exercises. So that will be more along the lines of a hands-on experience, as well as tabletop exercises that you can practice at your railroad. A little bit more about these programs. The direct employee program is when we come on site and we'll directly train and teach a higher awareness about the HMR and many of the other related topics about um, transporting hazardous materials directly to your employees. This can be more of an a la carte and you can pick which modules you might need a little bit more refresher with and we'll get to those modules in the next slide or you can go through all of them, which is we have five full modules and it could still be an eight hour day. But depending on which modules that you choose for your direct employee presentation will determine the, the length of our stay. Next option we have is the train the trainer. This is a full eight hour day, very comprehensive. We cover all five modules and in each of these, there is a pretest and there is a post test. This is to gauge the knowledge that we have in the beginning versus what we had at the end. Now, train the trainer events are built for trainers. I'm gonna say that word trainer a lot in here. So with that said, the trainers, when they go through our program, they're able to learn the materials, learn helpful tips on how to teach the materials, as well as at the end, have an option to also get those materials that we have developed and produced and share that with your railroad. So the numbers of students will exponentially grow. The requirement here for us with our grant is to ensure that we keep a very accurate head count of how many students go through our program. So whether it's direct employee, train the trainer, and then you're our trainer and train on our materials, we'll need to keep that head count. So I'll be making sure I'm in touch with you. And lastly, our drills touched on this a little bit but we are developing some pretty hands-on drills. They'll be not only real life uh, put into a scenario base, but also on site and uh, will be a great way to use the skills learned through a direct employee or a train the trainer course in person. 
All right, so that's a little bit about our program. Now we mentioned that there's some modules that each of these courses cover. Well, our modules are as follows. We have a general awareness module with function specific. We have safety and procedures. We have general and in-depth security, OSHA, and other regulatory awareness. So all five of these, when you mash them up together, they come up with an eight hour training course. Uh, general awareness, again, it, it really incites why we need to have a, a good training program, what we're going to be training on, um, as well as what we're really trying to avoid. Um, you know, there's there's always lessons learned in our industry, and we want to ensure that there's training that learn from these mistakes and is providing uh, really an importance of, of why we need to focus on hazmat training, some of the basics, and cover them in general awareness. So general awareness is our, our opening and our attention grabber. Then we go into function specific. And below there are a few that are bulleted below. So we have a real big focus on the transportation employees. So they'll be your conductors, engineers. We have uh, sections in there for document requ uh, required documentation for clerks. Then we also have aspects in there where maintenance of way and mechanical uh, might be directly affected. So. Throughout this function specific, this is one of our largest modules. It really covers the nuts to bolts of the HMR. Following our function specific, we wanna focus on safety and the procedures thereof. So this has a lot to do with the procedures and derailment, uh, damage assessment, uh, site and health safety plans, and other safety requirements that would be very good preventative measures, uh, such as inspections and other training. In addition, there's general and in-depth security. So that could be anywhere from uh, focusing on cybersecurity and strengthening companies' passwords if there are a lot of electronic devices that are used uh, to as far as what to look for uh, as far as TSA security awareness and alert levels. We also have a module about OSHA regulations, a little bit about EPA as well as other uh, regulatory awareness and spill prevention awareness. We'll get into that in just a little bit more at the end of this presentation. And as I mentioned, each one of these modules has a pretest and a protest, well, excuse me, pretest and a post-test section. So we were able to gauge that knowledge. And at the end, our test will um, obviously make sure that we see and improve of all of the knowledge that we learned from our courses. So on the right side, we have a couple pictures here and we have a shot of us in the field. We have Hank Cox over there pointing at a tank car with one of his groups. And just below that, we have an, a classroom example um, of one of our presenters who is guiding our classroom in, oh, it's Hank again. All right. And for this slide, I'll, I'm going to turn it over to some of our experts so that you can hear some someone else speak for a little bit and also uh, we'll guide you a little bit more of, of what we're looking at here. So, Harry, do you mind taking over? Yes. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, this is Harry Hopes. Uh, this is just a couple of photographs of some recent training events that we have held in Tennessee, Nebraska, and Alabama. And as you can see, we go throughout the United States to uh, uh, provide these presentations to shortline uh, groups. Uh, our training, as Michelle said, our training consists of not only classroom, but field exercises and hands-on training as well. Uh, the normal size groups that we've been seeing is anywhere from approximately 18 to 36 uh, individuals. Uh, the best classes are the ones with interactions. Uh, this way, the each individual gets to ask their questions and it is really well received. Thanks, Harry. So at this point, we wanted to share with you guys some of the experts that we do have on our team, and they're listed here on this slide. We have a few of them with us today. And to ensure that we get a good hold of their knowledge here today, we're going to ask them some questions. So we do have some pre-formulated questions we have here and some that we got uh, ahead of this webinar. So we will ask those first. And then at the end, if you do have any questions for our experts, please feel free to use that tool on the lower right-hand side where it says questions. And we'll read them first come, first serve. 
All right, so we have the first question here for our trainers. What do you like most about being a part of this training program? And I'm gonna start this off with uh, Mr. Tim Manis. Would you mind kicking us off here? Thank you, Michelle. Um, first of all, I'm proud to be part of this program because it relates to safety and transportation. And when I speak about safety and transportation, I don't only mean yours and your employees, but I mean also the, the communities uh, you service. In those communities, we have our families, our children, grandchildren. Uh, we also have relatives and friends. So it's incumbent upon us to ensure that we follow these safety rules, these regulations, to make sure that our loved ones uh, remain safe. And that's why I'm proud to be part of this. Thanks, Yeah, Tim. Michelle, this, this, this is Carl Gerhard Stein. Um, yeah, I'll chime in there too. I mean, I've really enjoyed meeting the railroad people in various parts of the country that we've done our, our training classes at. You know, and it, it's been great to enhance the knowledge um, with, with by sharing some of our training materials, you know, with the ultimate goal, making their programs better um, and really, you know, continuing to prove the safety um, that the railroads provide in, in, in transporting our nation's hazmats. You know, I've been really impressed with the, the people we've met, um, their passion, their professionalism, you know, their, their thirst for knowledge. Um, we've had some great interactions and great training um, with the ultimate goal of making you know, a safe way to move hazardous material even safer. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. All right, I think that about covers that question. Let's see what else we got here. Which module is receiving the most engagement so far? Carl, why don't you take this one? Yeah, I think you know all the modules um, have been well received, and and we've had a lot of engagement and questions going back and, and forth. Um, the OSHA, that, which covers OSHA, EPA, and spill awareness module, um, has, has generated a lot of interest and questions. Um, you know, all, you know a lot of it dealing with you know what OSHA regulates, which versus what FRA regulates out on the railroad. Um, you know, which is basically, you know, OSHA does regulate the, the railroads programs um, um, in addition to FRA, um, you know, and FRA can supersede OSHA uh, only when they have regulations in place um, for what they're, they're regulating. Um, so we kind of go in detail explaining FRA regulates this, OSHA regulates that. But for example, you know, FRA has decided that, hey, we're going to regulate bridge fall protection. Um, in addition to what OSHA has, we're taking that over. Um, you know, they've also done that FRA has issued specific regulations on cab noise and locomotives. Um, FRA has passed additional regulations um, for positive air pressure and certain types of maintenance way equipment. Um, just a couple examples, things that we've been covering and getting questions on, you know, concerning what the, um, what the big question is, hey, what does FRA regulate and what does OSHA regulate? You know, there has been this known for, for a while that OSHA didn't really regulate the railroads, which I think everybody's kind of beyond that now and in, in trying to understand the different programs. Um, we've had, you know, questions concerning the confined space and some of the unique confined spaces that railroad workers may find themselves, um, you know, coming across and how to properly handle that. Um, we've had a lot of engagement and discussions on we cover uh, what qualifies is hot work for setting up hot work permits, you know, when you're doing any kind of torch work or spark generating, heat generating, um, and share some examples on that. Um, had, had a lot of questions um, concerning, you know, this was more in the other regulations part of this on the, the DOT requirements that require railroads to have an oil spill prevention and response plans um, when transporting oil in packages greater than 3,500 gallons. In addition to plans you have to have at fixed facilities, but these are plans that the railroads are required to have 
when they're transporting the oil when it's still in transportation per DOT regs. But you know, a lot of great engagement, a lot of good questions in all the modules. Um, these are just some of the ones you know in the OSHA, EPA, um, and other regulations section. So, thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Carl. And I just want to tag team on that just a little bit from what Carl was mentioning. So a lot of excitement is coming off of those OSHA modules. And so far, just to date, a little bit of a, a program update here from the program manager. Uh, we have eight events that have been completed so far. That's over 20 railroad uh, companies that have been involved and have participated in our training events. 80% of those training events have actually been trained the trainer. 20% have been direct employee. And we have over 130 employees and students in our program. So it's uh, really great numbers and we're seeing some really good feedback about that. And, and we're really happy to, to be here today, not only to do this webinar, but to be doing these training programs out there and uh, answering any questions that you may have about hazardous materials. So we're, we're here to help and, and we'll continue forward with some more questions to our experts. Alrighty, so it seems like a pretty basic question, but you know, it, it's kind of easily confused sometimes. So let's ask this question. Who is a hazmat employee? And if I can, I'll get uh, Mike to come on, introduce yourself and uh, go ahead and answer this one. Thank you, Michelle. My name is Mike Beachy. Who is a hazmat employee? Uh, under 49 CFR, uh, 172.704. It is anyone who loads, unloads, or handles a hazardous material while in transportation. So if you have a clerk that uh, handles a bill of lading, generates it into a way bill, you have a mechanical inspector inspecting the rail car, the package, and you have transportation employees that are moving the package, or you have maintenance of way people who are handling uh, hazardous materials on their truck, as in propane, oxygen, or acetylene, they have to be trained under the five sections so we can move forward and not have the FRA, the enforcement branch, uh, come out and cite a violation. Thank you. All right, thanks Mike for answering that. Now a follow-up question that we have for that is how often is hazmat training required by regulation? Required by regulation is any person that you hire or transfers into handling hazardous materials must be trained and the training must be completed within 90 days. Uh, and for reoccurrent training, once every three years, they must be brought up and trained. Their training records must be kept for inspection, along with uh, the type of training on the five sections, what the test was, and uh, how long the program went. It has to be all kept in the employee's uh, record so you do not end up with a notice of violation. Thank you, Michelle. Great. Mike, I had a follow-up question that just popped up in our questions bar, and I know it's going to hold us to the end, but it's a really good question that tags on with this. So if I can keep you just for another minute here, um, who is supposed to keep the hazardous materials training requirement or uh, the, the training documentation that it occurred? The, returning, the recurrent training must be kept by the company, uh, your company, your short line railroad, must be kept on file in the employee's record or a general record area that can be accessed uh, if you have more than one location when an FRA inspector comes in to request when the training was done, completed, and what type of training they have been through. Perfect. Thank you so much for that answer, Mike. You're welcome. All right, let's see what else we have here. All right, so here's a good question. Who regulates railroads for hazardous materials? We'll go with uh, Harry. What do you think about this one? Well, the Department of Transportation is actually the governing agency that writes and publishes the regulations for hazardous materials uh, in the United States. 
Also, in addition to that, the Federal Railroad Administration is actually the department of the Department of Transportation that has the authority to issue fines and penalties for violations of these rules. So basically, the Department of Transportation uh, writes the rules and regulations. The FRA is the uh, agency or department that actually can issue the fines and penalties for violations. Understood. Okay. Thank you, Harry. All righty. What is the most common hazmat violation found by inspectors? Tim Manis, would you mind giving us a little intro to you and uh, give a shot at this question here? Um, I believe the two most common violations that a FRA or state inspector will find is something as simple as missing or incorrect placards on a hazmat shipment, and the other one would be uh, improper uh, hazardous material shipping documents, which would include uh, things such as improperly prepared uh, shipping paper uh, descriptions, and it would also include lack of or improper uh, placement and train documents. These, to me, over my years, have seen the two most common violations that uh, the um, regulatory agencies cite. All right, Tim, would you mind uh, talking a little bit about you uh, and your experience with hazardous materials for our audience here so they get to know our trainers a little bit better? And we'll sprinkle that in throughout the rest of the presentation as well. Oh, geez. I've, uh, uh, this is my 50th year in the railroad industry. Uh, I have 10 years mechanical department experience. I spent uh, 37 years actively employed by railroads in the hazardous materials field, uh, the Association of American Railroads Bureau of Explosives, um, some time with Conrail, some time with Norfolk Southern, and retired from CSX Transportation. Since then, I've been doing some consulting work for the railroad industry, including, uh, as I said before, uh, proudly uh, working with the Short Line Safety Initiative here. Thanks, Tim. I appreciate it. All right, so our follow-up question for the above question here is, how can we, at our railroad, prevent this? Um, Mike, would you mind taking a stab at this one? We, we introduced you, so let's hear what your expertise has to say about that one. Well, first and foremost, it's testing and record keeping, all right? Um, when your employee starts, you do your 90-day. You make sure you maintain those records. And then getting out into the field and doing core checks or e-testing, whatever it may be called, to visually meet with your employees when they make a pickup or a set out uh, in transportation, to that they're updating the train placement, that they have the proper way bills for doing the pull in place for the customer, or inside the yard when they're switching to make sure once the train is made up, that mechanical is doing the proper inspection checking the placards, checking the specification stencil, and going through the standard 215 inspection process to make sure it's safe when the train is pulled out of the yard. All right, that's great advice. Thanks, Mike. All right, at this time, before we get any further and get some of your questions here answered live, I do wanna go through the rest of our folks that are on this webinar with us today and let them tell you a little bit about their expertise. We heard from a few of them already, uh, but let's touch base here with Harry Hopes. Would you mind giving us a little introduction to you and a little bit about your experience with hazardous materials on the railroad? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I started in 1975 uh, with a company called Penn Central Railroad out of the Bronx in New York City uh, as a trainman. Uh, I worked in a variety of different departments, including the uh, maintenance way, purchasing, safety, environmental, hazardous materials department, transportation, of course. Um, I had a very fortunate career. 
I retired in July of 2015 uh, from CSX Transportation, and I'm happy to say that I am a trainer for the Shortline Safety Institute. Thank oh, and you. we're happy to have you. <laughs> Alrighty, so let's go to Carl. Carl, tell us a little bit about you and your experience with the rail industry. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. Um, yeah, Carl Gerhard Stein, um, based out of Jacksonville, Florida. Um, started in the rail industry back in 1983. Um, and similar to Harry, I've been in a couple different departments from engineering, maintenance away, um, and then been with the public safety hazmat and environment team um, for about half my career. Um, started um, assisting with the Short Line Safety Institute back in the, in the spring after retiring after about 35 years um, with class one. So just excited to be part of the program and, and, and share some of the great training programs that the Short Line Safety Institute has um, developed. Thanks, Carl. Mike, we touched base with you, but a little bit. Do you want to just give us a little bit about your years of experience? Thank you, Michelle. Um, started back in 1979. I was a uh, mechanic for Eastern Railway Supplies, and then I came on to Conrail, uh, went into the transportation department as a brakeman, conductor, and then an engineer. And in uh, 2001, I came over to the Transportation Hazardous Material Public Safety and Environment Group uh, as a manager for hazardous materials based out of Buffalo, New York. And I retired March of 2017 after 34 years. And I'm enjoying, uh, since the spring of this year, working with the Short Line Safety Institute and uh, all the other trainers and the managers there. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Mike. All right. We're happy to have you as well, everybody here. All right. Um, we have two more folks, and that is uh, Hank Cox. Would you like to? share with the audience a little bit about your experience as well before we get into some more of these questions that our audience has. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I've been involved with hazardous materials for 47 years. I uh, actually started in the chemical industry before I went to, to the railroad. Uh, spent uh, 30 years in the railroad industry after that and uh, I started railroad in 1980. Left the railroad, went to uh, Colorado and worked as a hazmat instructor for seven years and decided it was a lot more uh, interesting to do it than it was to talk about it. But then a certain time in life you get old, so I retired in uh, 2011. And since then I've been doing some consulting work and uh, most recently uh, with SLSI. Thanks for that recap, Hank. And last but not least, we do have Ron Romano De Simone who has joined us. Romano, will you tell us a little bit about your background as well? And then we'll get right into these questions. Well, thank you, Michelle, and good afternoon, y'all. Um, I am one of the younger guys in the group, I would guess, uh, 37 years uh, with a class uh, one railroads, uh, started in uh, Conrail and moved down to CSX, um, spent about the last 20 years in hazmat. and. I've got to say, um, ditto to what I've heard about, um, you know, my colleagues here about other railroads. Uh, it's been um, great to be um, one of the contractors with the Short Line Safety Institute only in the past seven months or so going out and uh, meeting some of the short line roads out there. I've got to say I've been very impressed with the operations uh, that I've seen and the compliance to the DOT regulations. I'm also looking forward to see how we can improve that. Uh, what our experience uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Romano. All right, folks. Well, you heard it from our experts themselves. We have a wide range of expertise in the rail industry as well as chemicals and the whole hazmat industry. So uh, we're excited to take your questions. We have a few right here. So feel free at this time to type in some answers or questions uh, to get answered here live. And we will do so here in just a few minutes. The first one I have here, uh, a little bit more administrative, so I'll take uh, I'll take that one real quickly. So how do you sign up to get our training? Well, that's a great question. Um, you could talk to me, you could talk to any of our hazmat 
subject matter experts, our, our trainers. Um, they'll have uh, shortlinesafety.org email addresses. So it's their first period last name and then that. Or you can contact me and I'll have my contact information here at the end and I'll make sure that you get set up and on the schedule for our next round of funding, keeping our fingers crossed for that. All right, so how do you sign up? You send us an email. Um, you can also do it on our website. So that's www.shortlinesafety.org. Um, there is a new request form that you could just pop in there and I'll get a notification and I'll be following up with you within a day. So be sure to, to use either of those outlets to you to start scheduling some training for the upcoming year. Uh, another one at the end of the training session, what happens? How do you get the materials? Okay. Uh, again, I'll just I'll field this one real quickly as well, and then we'll get into some of the other meat and potato questions we have here on our answer question board coming up. Um, so at the end of a training session, uh, we have for our train the trainer events. If you are a trainer and you want to use our materials in your next training session at your railroad, um, there's just a few things that you need to do. One is send me an email. That's a common theme here. So uh, I'll make sure you get connected to the right people and the right resources if you need anything. And uh, by doing that, what will happen next is we send you a, re a we transfer. Um, it, it's like a link. And uh, once you open that up, you just download uh, the materials that we send you that are the most up to date materials that we have. And we will send them to you. They're PowerPoints, they're instructor guides, they're sign in sheets. Um, a lot of resources are available to you, and we do hope you take advantage of them. Um, so as a trainer, that's the process. Shoot me an email. Um, I'll get you the materials. And then when you have a training on the schedule for your railroad, uh, all we need to do is get a headcount back and a date and a location of your training. It's imperative, as Mike said before, you keep your own records of your training, um, but we do this for our backup data uh, you know, warehousing of entry, and uh, we just want to make sure that we're tracking all of our students and ensuring the right headcounts for our sponsors. Alrighty, with those questions out of the way, I will start with our first question that we have here. All right. So, um, how does OSHA hazardous communications right to know? regulations interact with hazardous materials training for hazmat employees. Carl, I'm going to go ahead and direct this one to you. Um, yeah, so how does it, can you read that again, Michelle? Okay. How does it interact? Yes. How does OSHA hazardous communications right to know regulations interact with hazardous materials training for hazmat employees? Yeah, I think, you know, that it's got a direct relationship, you know, for the, when it comes to the um, safety data sheets, you know, which were pre previously mentioned, you know, as material safety data sheets. So having those data sheets available um, and knowing where to get those for your employees, not only if it's just a chemical or something in your shop, but if you have something that you're transporting and being able to pull up the information specific to the commodity in the tank car, um, it just gives you more additional information that you can use um, in planning the um, response to any kind of emergency involvement in hazmats that would have an SDS sheet. All right, thank you, Carl. Um, all right, here we go. In 234, it talks about hazmat training. All I can see is it's for transportation. If they are a small com commuter rail maintenance facility, do they fall under that reg? Hello, Michelle. This is this is Tim. My my, my reply would be that if you have hazmat employees all those regulations apply to you. So uh, if you are handling uh, hazardous materials, if you are storing hazardous materials, uh, if you are uh, preparing shipping documents for hazardous materials, yes, all those training requirements apply to you also. 
Okay, thank you, Tim. All right, our next question. Is there any training on the regulations for transporting commodities by commodities, such as 40 CFR Part 279 used oil, EPA hazardous waste to find an RICIRA and FIFRA products regulated by the EPA in 40 CFR 156.10? Question mark. I'm going to guess this is a Carl question, but anybody want to answer this one? Go right ahead. Yeah, read that one again. That was pretty. Sure thing. I'm going to try to give as much life as I can to the CFR reading. So here we go. Is there any training on the regulations for transporting commodities by commodities, such as 40 CFR Part 279, used oil EPA hazardous waste defined in RICRA and FIR, oh, I'm sorry, FIFRA products regulated by the EPA in 40 CFR 156.10? If we don't go in depth, and it sounds like they're concerned, you know, we're talking about user dual transportation and training on that. Um, we do not go in depth in that in the training module um, on user dual. We do talk about some of the paperwork required in transporting that, but we do not have a specific module um, covering used oil. You know, that can be specific not only on the federal, but a lot of states regulate used oil a lot more stringent than the, the feds do. So it would it's a little difficult to cover in, in limited time. We have all the state rules in addition to the federal rules and move in um, use dual. And Hank, you got something to add to that? Yeah, would that not be uh, something that somebody like Lion Technology could be much more specific in that area if they really needed to get down and dirty with that uh, area? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great suggestion. Yeah, also, this is Mike Beachy. The under 279, your used oil regulations, if you're looking to transport it, you have to go to 170 to 101, the hazardous material table, and find the proper package to put the used oil in, if that's the way I'm uh, seeing the question. Um, applicability as far as transportation always flows to the hazardous material tables under 172.101. Okay, thanks guys for that. And uh, the, the person that did uh, submit that question, if you do have additional follow-up questions regarding that um, or would like to continue that conversation, my contact information will be listed on the last slide. Feel free to shoot me an email and I'll make sure we connect um, again uh, about this topic and i'll also put in a shameless plug for our training so if your railroad hasn't received our training yet also email me and we can see when we can schedule you to have our osha spill awareness and epa module come out to your your property all right that's enough marketing from, from me for today so let me give it to the next question <laughs> It was mentioned that if a clerk generates a way bill for transportation of hazardous material, they would need to be trained in hazardous materials. What about a property manager who purchases track that hazardous materials will be transported on? A manager who is over train masters involved in supervising hazardous materials transport, transport and a customer service representative taking a call from a member of the public reporting a hazardous spill. So let's back up here. I'll go one question at a time. That was just the full Monty of it. So it was mentioned that if a clerk generates a waybill for transportation of hazardous materials, they would need to be trained in hazardous materials. So the first question we have here is what about a property manager who purchases track that hazardous materials will be transported on? No, if I, they are not, they would not be a hazmat employee uh, under the definition of 171.8. Correct. All right. The second part of that question is, what about um, a manager who is over train masters involved in supervising hazardous material transport? That, that would be a yes, because they are oversight and they, anyone who directly affects the safety of transportation of hazardous materials must be trained. 
and that is under 171.8. So yes, a manager would be. All right, thanks, Mike. Last question we have here is a customer service representative taking a call from a member of the public reporting a hazardous spill. No, they uh, they would not be a uh, hazmat employee. They don't directly affect the transportation of the hazardous materials uh, safety. They're basically a call taker or a 911 dispatcher. Thanks for that clarification, guys. All right, so the next question that we have here, when the short line hosts the training, what does the railroad need to supply for that training? This is a great question and I'll get us started and the trainers can kick in their knowledge as well. Um, so to, typically when we have a training on site, um, so for the majority of our trainings so far this year, they have been train the trainer events. And so what this means is we really need your commitment, um, but the way that we kind of like to look at it is this is your event. So being that it's your event and we're providing the experts to speak specifically about this subject and the resources that we have built, um, this is your event. So, you know, we, we like to keep the classes less than 25 folks, um, a classroom um, with one railroad or a neighboring railroad, it usually is, is pretty effective because then if there is a specific regional question um, pertaining to hazardous materials that might affect both companies in that same geographic location, um, it, it's easier to ask uh, more detailed questions. Uh, so, you know, keeping it between 20 and 25 is, is really what we shoot for and keeping it a little bit more regionally based is, is a great idea as well. Uh, however, if your company is big enough, we can always uh, use your, your company base, have your trainers in there and, and put um, direct employee training as well in there, meaning everybody's going to sit through the eight hour course, but only the trainers are going to graduate with the uh, train the trainer co completion certificate. The other folks will just have the direct employee training certificate. Um, but as far as other resources, uh, what we really need is a room that could fit that many participants. Um, you, you know, you're your commitment uh, for a certain date on the calendar that doesn't necessarily obstruct any kind of operational plan that you guys have. It is training for a full day. So, you know, you're going to have folks that are going to be sitting in there for a full eight hour class. Um, so their time will be something you want to consider. Um, as far as that, you know, we, we really bring most of the other things. We, we bring the expertise, we bring the presentations, we bring the materials. Uh, additional materials that we do bring besides the ones that we've developed are um, ERGs of 2016, the tank car guidebooks from AR, um, as well as the DOT chart 16s and some answer sheets and science sheets and things of that nature. Um, guys, what what do you guys think as well? Uh, trainers, do you want to offer any other suggestions there of what a railroad may need to supply for a training that you've experienced? The only other thing I would say, you know, is, is access access to um, a yard is, is always good to have a couple um, tank cars set outside for part of the um, the outdoor training part. Um, that's always a, a big help when we can do, you know, part of the inside training and then go outside and, and kind of see some of the stuff we've been talking about on a specific tank car and the markings and inspections and securement and all, all the different regulatory requirements. Thanks, Carl. Anyone else want to add anything? Michelle, have you mentioned at all about the uh, safety train? No, but I was going to do that next if no one did. So you can go right ahead, Harry, if you want to talk about it. <laughs> that's, that's Mr. I'm going to pass that one over to Mr. BG because that is his expertise. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Hope. Uh, the safety train is uh, provided to the Shortline Safety Institute through the Firefighters Education and Training Foundation, Mr. John O'Neill. Um, safety and Training Fund, the Firefighters Education and Training Foundation has been in existence since the mid-90s. Uh, the train consists of a boxcar, 
which is a classroom, a flat car, which has valve housings on it off of uh, different uh, rail cars, general service and pressure service cars, uh, intermodal container also. Uh, then it has a uh, DOT 111, a legacy car, a DOT, uh, what we classify as a uh, AAR circular CPC 1232, which is the uh, enhanced tank car for uh, flammable liquids and a DOT 112 pressure car and a DOT 105 car for uh, pressure gas, uh, chlorine, sulfur dioxide along in that as also it can be used as an over package as Mr. Manis would always say. But this comes in and it is uh, free uh, when we can get it into your short line, uh, when you're hosting an event uh, to use it and go out and do hands-on sections on the flat car, teaching the uh, students or attendees, train the trainers or direct employees, what's inside of a valve housing, how to properly make sure the bottom of the car is secured for when you go back in or when your employees go back and train your people to look at the bottom outlet cap, make sure it's tight, make sure there's a pin in the bottom outlet handle, that the trucks are not skewed. Uh, things like that that fall within the hazardous material instructions and part 215 of the uh, Code of Federal Regulations. How's that? That's good. Thanks, Mike. And I just want to put a caveat in there regarding the safety train because it's not a guaranteed process and there is a very full schedule for that. So we do the best we can to accommodate when it is requested. Um, just just keep in mind it, it's not a, a guaranteed process and um, they do have scheduling restraints for that. Um, if we do go out in the yard and do some hands-on demonstration like Harry, Mike, uh, Tim were mentioning, then we would ask that the students bring their PPE um, so that they are in full compliance with whatever host railroads rules are. Um, so that is a key element of safety that we definitely make a priority. So just keep that in mind if you do have hands on training to have spare PPE for those that might not have brought it. And um, lastly, if, if the company wants to provide lunch, I'm not saying you have to, I'm just saying, it, you know, makes, <laughs> makes for good conversation at lunchtime. But uh, other than that, we just kind of brown bag it um, or go somewhere local and uh, water if, if your railroad can um, provide some water and some cups, some coffee. You know, it, it's really up to your railroad how your training looks. We're very flexible and you know, we're going to make it work. So if you have a classroom on site, um, if we can't go outside, if we can't get the safety train, um, you know, we're, we're going to make this work. So um, it's it's very variable on how the training itself can look. Um, so if you have any ideas in mind or, you know, when, when you're ready to schedule your your training session, just just let us know what, what you're thinking about and, and we'll see uh, see what we can do for you. All right. We'll move on to the next question. So where can I find more detailed information regarding OSHA and FRA regulations? Specifically, what does OSHA regulate? Yeah, Michelle, this is Carl. I can handle the, um, the, the OSHA piece. So OSHA has, um, if you go to their website, OSHA gov um, they have some good overview an eight, eight hour OSHA and a 30 hour OSHA class that you can take online um, to help you get more versed on the regulations and what they do and don't regulate um, you know across the, the rail industry but I would suggest starting out with the eight hour class um, or just doing research online um, signing up for one of our classes we kind of do an overview um, of the OSHA regulations and you know some of the key ones that tie into railroads, um, but you can also get information online um, for specific training. And it's it's always good to have several of your people um, do these eight-hour and thirty-hour classes. You know your your key safety people and key shop 
managers and facilities, um, it's great to have um, the, the OSHA 30-hour class. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Carl. And I'll also mention, too, that um, our Module 4 OSHA and other regulations does touch base and has a couple pictures of, of things that OSHA would kind of regulate, and it does delve into to the regs a little bit more um, in some of a more high-level uh, manner, um, if, if you will, that will be available if any of you are going to be going to the ASLRA's uh, regional meetings this year in September, October, and November. We will be having a breakout session there that does a high-level overview of what OSHA um, looks like in one of our modules. Again, it's a high level, uh, so it's not all of the full details of what we would do in our module, but you do get a, a nice taste of what OSHA regulates. And it comes fully packed with expertise. Carl and Mike Themester of our team will be leading the course. And uh, you'll be able to see some really good examples there as well. Uh, if, if any of those questions could be answered there, you know, we'll, we'll be at all those events to answer your questions and offer that direct training right then and there at the breakout sessions. So f feel free to look us up there. And um, if you need any more information, get in touch with us. And we'll, we'll see how we can help you. All right, we have three more questions and then we will wrap it up. So the next question that we have here is, who is responsible for hazmat cars when they are on the interchange track? When does liability transfer to the destination road? I'm gonna let Harry pick this one at first. That is an extremely good question. <laughs> uh, uh, there was a railroad called CSX that uh, ended up being the end result of that many, many years ago. But um, the way it works is when the cars are turned over to the other railroad, the other rail carrier, uh, at that point when they are dropped off or constructively placed, that is when the uh, authority or the responsibility should take place. And notice I said should, because attorneys can get involved with this and they can change things around, but it has to do with constructive placement. Tim, you, you want to mention also, that? you want to add anything on positive and Shakur handoff too? Yeah, uh, and that is one of the reasons why we have the uh, regulation that has to do with rail security sensitive materials with the positive handoff of these different types of commodities, whether it be handing it off to another railroad or handing it off to a um, uh, customer. All right. Anybody else want to tag in any other information on that? I believe you'd have to take a look at your um, interchange agreement with the uh, carriers you interchange with as to when uh, acceptance of the hazardous material is. That's the most important thing. Um, in the old days, people would say, hey, it's on your interchange track. It's your problem. Well, that's not it. That's not what it is. Um, so I would strongly suggest that if you have a question as to when is a shipment accepted in interchange, go back and take a look at your interchange agreement. All right. Thank you, Tim. All right. We have two more left. And here is second to last one. All right. So in um, 172.704 D5 requires a certificate for training. Can this just be a record of training or does this have to be in a prescribed format? Exact wording of reg is certificate certification that the hazmat employee has been trained and tested as required by this subpart. Well, Michelle, go ahead, Hank. Please. The DOT regulations are very specific as to what information you have to have and for how long you have to maintain records for your employee through their employment 
and 90 days after their employment with you. Um, you have to have access to the training documents so that you can print well, the training materials, I'm sorry, not just the documents. So they're, they're very specific as to um, what you are required to have on hand and, and furnish them. Um, the, the, under, under that, the certification is a written letter by you, the hazardous material employer, stating that the employee has been trained under 172.704 to meet all five functions if it is applicable to their job and it is signed by a company or the training official. You can call it a certificate. It is a letter of certification, but it has to be maintained in the employee's file, as Tim said. The, the, the word certify certification, that must be included and documents for that hazmat employee. It can't be that they've received training. It must be something to the effect of this is a certified they did it, or here's this is a certification that they have done it. But the uh, Federal Railroad Administration is very adamant that the word certification or a variation of it be included in that documentation for each hazmat employee. Yeah, I believe it has to say certificate of completion. It also has to state on that certificate what sections they completed, if I remember correctly. You are correct, sir. All right, thank you guys for answering that. Our last question here is, who regulates radioactive waste? There was a, a company that was recently approached in moving some of this radioactive waste recently and wants to find out some more information about it. Well, th this is Harry Hopes. Uh, radioactive waste, uh, first of all, they're regulated by the Department of Transportation. If you're going to move them by rail, once again, the FRA would be the group that would be uh, issuing any fines and penalties. However, you're going to get a lot of other agencies involved, including uh, state agencies, uh, depending on the type of radioactive waste you're gonna be moving uh, and through what states. Uh, radioactive materials, with the exception of norm, can get to be extremely difficult uh, to move and to comply with the regulations unless you have someone uh, very experienced with this or you or uh, your shipper is extremely experienced uh, with this. And by norm, I mean naturally occurring radioactive material, basically dirty dirt. Mm -hmm. right. All right, thank you, Harry. And from all of us here at the Shoreline Safety Institute, we do want to thank you very much for taking some time out of your day to spend an hour with us. We enjoyed our time with you. Um, as you heard from our experts, it's, uh, it, it's always a great day here at the Shoreline Safety Institute working with such, such uh, experts in the field. And, and uh, you know, they're, they're a great team to work with, and, and we can't wait to come out to your property and show you our training program that we put together for you. Uh, just remember, our program is, is free. It's through a grant process from PHMSA, in addition to our other grant from the FRA, which we do the safety culture assessments on that side. Either side of the, the world, whatever you are interested in, you can contact um, our executive director, Tom Murda, with the email address listed there above, or me, and uh, I'll make sure you get connected in the right way or get you started with our HAZMAT training program and scheduling you for the next year. So if you have any questions, feedback, um, you know, any ideas for future webinars, please feel free to give me a shout, call me in my office, or we can talk on uh, email. 
Uh, thank you to our trainers for joining us today, guys. It's been a pleasure as always. And uh, thank you very much to our attendees that have joined us today. If you want to share this webinar, it will be available and as all of ours are recorded and it will be on our website. So please feel free to check back into that and review what you heard today already or share it with some of your folks at work. With that, make it a safe day and we will talk to you guys again soon. Thank you so much for joining us.